Hey guys, what's up? It's Finch here, and today we're going to be bringing you guys another special video. So no, I'm not going over a World Cup game between Pharaoh and Felix. I'm much in the contrary. I'm actually going to be making a video on how to pick out your lead, and we're going to make a little game of it as well. I'm going to see how accurate I am with my predictions of what these players are going to lead with. But anyway, so recently I made a video on how to use Team Preview to your advantage, get all the information you can out of it, make the certain inferences that might help you in the long term, and also just use information to your advantage in general. Now, a lot of people's response to that was, okay, that's great, and I love that information, but another part of Team Preview is picking a lead, so could you make a video on how to pick a lead and what goes into that thought process as well? And to that I said, sure, I will. I must note that picking a lead in SSLU, so long as you don't mess up horribly in the wrong matchup, is really a low-risk, low-reward type of dynamic, as in a lot of games are not going to be defined by the lead. This isn't a fast place tier like Black White OU or TPP OU to the extent that it's going to really determine too much in games, but it can still get you off in the right foot, and especially if you're using a more offensive team or more momentum-based, then it can go a long way. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to take you through five World Cup team previews, and I'm going to say, A, what I predict each player to lead with, B, why that is the case, and C, what to avoid leading with in some cases as well. Some games are going to be more obvious than others. For example, some teams, such as weather teams and hyper-offensive teams, have dedicated leads, which makes it pretty easy. Other teams might have less clear leading situations, in which case it might be more guesswork. And the fact of the matter is that there is no defined science to what to lead with. There is really no right and wrong answer here. A lot of it is just using game theory to improve your odds of having the best lead. You're never going to lead with the right thing every game. But if you don't clone yourself in the first turn, couple turns or from the lead, then you're going to be all right anyway. Um, because of this, I don't view this as like one of my most important or more like analytical videos, but it's still something that you guys seem to be sort of focused on. And I know a lot of you guys use more offensive teams on the ladder, so I think it's cool to like help you guys, um, just give you guys a little, I guess, indication of what I'm thinking about, you know, what I'm trying to do when I'm picking leads, because sometimes in those games you can go a long way and lead the right thing. Because you're going to have less longevity and every turn is going to matter more and more. Because if you're playing a game that lasts 30 turns, every turn is going to matter more of those 30 turns and every turn would matter in a game that's 60 or 100 turns. Because those games have a lot more, you know, longevity to them to the point where any, like, bit of progress can be negated easier. If the game's going 100 turns, odds are things have recovery, things have the ability to pivot it, things are bulkier. Whereas if your game's only going 30 turns, then odds are the teams are both more offensive and there's a lot of crucial turns that are going to decide the progress that's being made in the game. So, without further ado, before I go on and on and on, because it's already been almost three minutes, let's go ahead and get to our first example. Now, first off, these five games, um, Pharaoh versus Felix, Sidu Mass versus Ryza, Electric Wind versus CDU or Tristan Umbreon, Trickstreet versus Luthier, and last but not least, Rexus versus XM Raptor are all games for the playoffs of the World Cup Pokemon. I picked them at random. Some happened as recently as of today, and some happened over a week ago. Um, for example, the game I'm looking at right now happened on, I believe, like the 24th of July. Yeah, it's right in front of me down below. But uh, all these games are still pretty recent. They're all in the current metagame. Nothing's banned. The previous has changed, so nothing's changing. So the logic I'm using here does apply to current metagames. But of course, the logic I'm using also is only specific to each individual game. As in, I'm discussing the team preview that we're seeing in front of us. So I'm discussing the team preview between Pharaoh and Felix. I'm not discussing your team preview in your 1600 ladder match against Charizard Fan 68. No, 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 no. But if you can take the contents out of what I'm saying, then there are some universally applicable things. So be careful listening. You know, get your notepad out and take notes. Um, do not take notes to my videos, guys. If any of you have ever taken notes to my videos, then you've gone too far. A lot of this is just about listening, having fun, retaining the right information for you, and catering it to your play style. I'm not trying to mold you guys into like versions of me. I want you guys to all get your own individual takes and become your best individual players. Have the most fun for yourselves here. So I hope that's a positive takeaway here. But anyway. So in this game, we have Pharaoh using a team that's an Aura Veil team, and we have Worm Felix using a Pulky team. I'd even classify this as semi-stall, to be honest. Maybe even full stall, it's like a utility Volcarona, but we don't see that every day. There is a win condition in all that. So yeah. Wow, look at how majestic the two birds are. Mandibuzz and Corviknight just flapping the wings next to each other as quick as they can just to stay afloat, and then Volcarona just going so majestically next to them, just slowly flapping its wings. Ah. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh boy, we, we don't need a uh, Finchnet or ASMR. No, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> Alright, so looking at the teams, Pharaoh's lead seems pretty obvious to me. Okay, so there is an obvious lead for this team that could be led every single game, and that is Nine Tails Alola. So the idea behind this team is you lead Nine Tails Alola, and you click Aura Veil turn one, and then you're able to withstand attacks that do half damage, 
And that goes a long way considering you've got a lot of offensive Pokemon that like having free setup turns and free turns to get off damage. However, with that said, had I not seen this team previously, had someone on Team Italy not used it before, it's a Will of Fire team, I believe. Um, Will of Fire is like a common team builder in Team Italy. Then I would have known that it was not Stealth Rock Jirachi. It's actually combined stored power Jirachi with Substitute. That piece of information, see. Without that piece of information, I'd say, okay, if you're facing something that can get a one shot on the, uh, sorry, on the Ninetales, say something like you're scared of a Steel Wing Dragapult or a Ball Punch Scizor or you know, a couple other things come to mind as well. And those Pokemon don't one-shot Jirachi, so unfortunately if you're on something like Cinderace, you're shit out of luck regardless, but then leading with something like Jir Jirachi would make sense in those matchups get rocked, but I know it's not that set, so Jirachi's no longer really in the equation as lead. Leading with your combined stored power non-recovery move, Jirachi against a stall team with Volcarona, Mandibuzz, and Blissey is not going to end well for you, unfortunately. With that said, however, um, Ninetales isn't the only possibility here. If he's scared of getting swept by Volcarona turn 1, which is fair, he could potentially lead with Zero or Dragapult as well. I'm going to say that I would lead with Ninetales anyway, just because I had a Rivervale turn 1, let him get the Volk in, because then if he calls me with Volk, then I'm totally chill with that. I could just go Dragapult afterwards. And on top of that, you should be able to have Hypnosis on it as well, so you're not going to let it get more than one or two Quiver Dance at worst. But yeah, no, um, I'd lead Ninetales here, but I understand leaving either Dragapult if you're really scared of Zero uh, or... If you're really scared of Mand sorry, if you're really scared of Volcarona or Zero Aura, if you just kinda wanna have a more neutral match overall, especially if it's a grass not Zero Aura, because then it could break Quag and just really does well because Plasma Fist is everything else really hard. But yeah, that about does it. Alright, now um well, I can't switch sides without showing the leads, can I? Uh no, I'm not gonna risk that. Okay, so we're just gonna now we're looking at Warren Felix's team, also known as Girlfriend Sure Random. He's a really underrated player. I'm a big fan of his, but Anyway, that aside, in this game here, again, he's using a bulkier team. It's got Blissey, Quagsire, Toxapex, Volcarona, Corviknight, Mandibuzz. Now, normally in this team, you're going to want to lead with your Apex a lot of the time, just to spread status, give really knocked off, or even your Blissey if it's Stealth Rock, because why the hell not? But I don't even know if it's Stealth Rock, honestly. It might just be poor. Regardless of that, though, this time you definitely want to counter lead the Ninetales Lola, because if you lose Dragapult or Zara Orange, like try and beat the Volk, it's like, oh, who cares? You can just go to your switch in through the Dragapult, your Mandibuzz, or your Blissey, or your Toxpex. And if you lose Zara Aura, if it's Grass Up, that's a little bit annoying, but it's kind of inevitably annoying anyway. So you might even want to stand with that with Volk. So therefore, hmm, therefore I lead Volk Rona just because I have reactionary measures anyway. Yeah, like I see no reason not to lead with Volk here if I'm Worm. So in conclusion, uh, if, I'm, if I'm Felix, I'm leading with Volcarona. Yeah, no doubt about that. And if I don't lead Volk, then I guess I just lead Blissey and hope he... And that's like me predicting Dragapult, but I don't love that. I think that's kind of cheesy. I think I always lead Volk. Yeah. I can't lead Ninetales. If I'm Pharaoh, I lead Ninetales, but I'd understand the Dragapult or the Zero. So, I hope you guys understand why, but just to break it down a little bit more. Basically, part of leading, and the lead metagame, if you will, is basically predicting what the opponent's going to lead and in a way, the straight's a mind game, because they can predict you to predict what you're going to lead with. And then you could predict them to predict you to predict them. And then you're like, wait, this is going to like some like 40 chess, five times level predictions. And it's stupid. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Um, uh, a little, little sniffles right now, but hopefully you can't tell my voice. Um, my voice quality isn't the same, sorry guys. But don't worry, I'm definitely safe from... The, uh, the virus. No, it's just uh, been a long couple of weeks. I haven't been sleeping too well, so catch up to you. But anyway, that aside, um, my bad there. That aside, you definitely don't want to lead in things that lead to worst case scenarios. For example, if your team is 6 0 by the enemy Bishop and you have Pokemon that are complete setup fodder for it, whatever the most passive Pokemon in the game against Bishop is, let's say knock off Mandibuzz with Defog, sure. And you're like, okay, if he, if I don't have foul play in that mana buzz, and he gets his sword snaps up, Sucker Punch kills all my faster Pokemon, and knock off the Siren Head kills all my slower Pokemon for whatever reason, your team is just that blatantly underprepared for Bisharp, it's purely hypothetical. Odds are that leading mana buzz might not be it. And that's just one example, again. And odds are they're not going to lead Bisharp, but putting yourself in a position where you risk that, where you risk the unfavorable matchup against the best Pokemon on your team, it just doesn't make sense. Why risk losing the game on turn one? when you can put yourself in a better position. And then if they get in the advantage, you can risk yourself losing the game later on when at least that risk makes sense. 
leverage your risks as a player, guys. And what I mean by that is, I know, like, leverage your risk. Like, what the hell does that mean, Finch? What are you saying? This is not lawyer mumbo jumbo dumbo talk. No, 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 no. This is Pokemon. Let me explain. You don't always need to make super duper exciting and flashy plays at the league or in the first couple of turns of the games. Now, sometimes making them is appropriate. Sometimes they even come to you instinctually. That's a lot of the times it's the case for me in the ladder, as you guys can see. But a lot of times at the lead, sometimes leading in something that will lead you into a worst case, like neutral position, is best. So if you have a Pokemon that covers out all the bases, great. If not, then try and find the thing with the least downside and say, okay. What is the worst they could do for this is if, if the worst thing that they could do is just have like a little advantage I could switch out to a checker counter, then odds are that's the Pokemon to lead with. So seeing as he's playing a uh, stall team like this and he's got general like initial switch and everything, leading with Volcarona is very little downside for Felix. It's just an example because again, if he leads into Pult or Halucho or Zera Aura, he could switch out. Well, honestly, against Zero Aura, he's fine just trading with it because the Volk's not doing much in this game anyway. It's still more mostly spendable Pokemon. Getting damage off on it if it's Grass not or Special is really nice. Well, Grass not mixed even because if it's Special, then Blissey loves it. But yeah, no. Um, I just think that if you're in Felix's shoes, then Volk is a really foolproof lead. As for Pharaoh, it really depends if you predict Volk, then you go Dragapult. But otherwise, just Ninetales is a straightforward lead. I don't know how much credit I give him, I don't know. But. Well, we'll see here. So, all right, we're gonna be seeing the lead. It's gonna be Dragapult on Volcarona. Okay, so Volcarona was indeed correct, and Felix made the right decision there. And I hope you guys noticed the concepts that I kind of alluded to and were able to apply them to your games there about leveraging risks or just minimizing risk and finding the right time to take risks later on in games when the game's on the line has come down to a couple specific turns. Then taking a risk is all the power to you. Take that risk. If you need to, you need to. You gotta do what you gotta do to win the game. That's straightforward for sure, but yeah, no, not here. And here, the right lead was the right lead. Um, for Pharaoh, he predicted the Volk lead, which was a really smart piece of uh, foresight by him, and he led with the Dragon Pulse. That's great. I'm curious to see what happens in the first couple turns here. Just gonna like it. So we see Quagsire come in, and yeah, predicts the, the physical variant. Okay, that was a smart play. So yeah. In conclusion, uh, I got like one and a half out of two leads here. I mean, nine tells was like my primary lead, but I knew. There's a chance to lose some of the threatened Volk there, so yeah, you get the concept. All right, so now we are through one game and talking about their leads. We have four more to go, so don't worry, there's more coming. This time, it is a game between Pseudomass and Ryoza. In fact, this game happened today on August 1st of 2020, but I did see, and spoiler alert, that Ryza won with the assistance of his germ, but I did not see the early game. Uh, I was in the middle of a tournament series, actually. I think this was when I was playing for RU Open, which I just won earlier today against a really good friend of mine, Mr. Aldo, who was... Great player and even a better contributor, but yeah, unfortunately I had to knock him out. But anyway, uh, that aside, so Sea Dumas is on Team France, Rise is on Team Italy. They're both using sand teams, but they have different kind of flashy Pokemon if you both have Cinderace, but Togekiss and Sherm are present for Ryza, whereas Crodon and Zera Aura are present for Sea Dumas. And then we have Blissey on Rise's team versus a Clefable on Sea Dumas' team, and then again Hippowdon plus Ferrothorn plus Cinderace are on both teams. So yeah. Interestingly, semi-similar compositions, if you will. But one thing really stands out to me about Ryze's matchup, and that is the presence of Kyurem. Kyurem with a choice back set is absolutely devastating to see the mass. It will destroy his entire life. Ice Beam is only resisted by Crodon, which is no special bulk, and Cinderace, which is frail overall. Freeze Dry also hits the Crodon for a one-shot, and if the Cinderace comes in on an Ice Beam or Freezer, it's going to get two killed, but also Earth Power and Draco just nuke it in one hit. And all of a sudden, you're like, wait a minute, Rises Kyurem does do pretty well, and he's got Teleport Blizzy, but his Defogger is Togekiss? What? That's not a good look for a Spex Kyurem against a really reliable Rocker like you pout on. That's not good. But I'm going to assume it's Spex Kyurem. If it's not Specs, then it's probably walled by the Fable. And that would be really unfortunate for Ryza because that would make his matchup hard with Togekiss being dealt with by Zara Aura and Kyurem being dealt with by Clefable and Cinderace being dealt by Pip Powdown. It's going to be a long day for Ryza. But I'm going to assume it's a set that can make progress or at least force Cedar Mass onto his toes. And given that, I think leading with it makes the most sense. Zara Aura can't one shot you. Cinderace never runs that gem kick anymore, so it can't one shot you. Crowdon can't one-shot you, and it dies to freeze dry, so it's going to be forced out, and it's not being led with ever anyway. The only bad lead matchup is Clefable and potentially a Thunder Wave Ferrothorn, and Ferrothorn you can switch out against easily, and, well, 
Clefable, I mean, if you can't switch, out, switch into a Clefable on turn one, then you're going to lose anyway. So you could definitely do that with this team, as you can see. So yeah. Um, Charm seems like the best lead here. The drawbacks are minor and switchable. The uh, pros are amazing if it's specs and you just Ice Beam plus Freeze Dry through, it's going to do really well. As for c Mass, hmm. Well, he's going to be scared of Kiram, so I think leading with something that could at least threaten it is important. Um, Clef is my first lead pick, just because it does well there, and it can potentially go for combine shenanigans or trick shenanigans or, you know, knockoff utility sets, but it really depends on the Clef set. If it's a Clef set that lacks combine or, like, knockoff or a status move, and it's just like wish port, and then leading with it doesn't make much sense at all. So if it's, if it's like that, then I'd lead with the uh, Cinderace or the Zero Aura because they generate momentum. I think Cinderace makes more sense here because leading Zero Aura against the Powdown plus Farathorn just doesn't. Look, yeah, you know, what? leading Cinderace is the secondary to Clef. It really depends on the Clef set. So I think Clefable and Cinderace, either or, is the right answer here. Uh, now it's worth noting again, a lot depends on your sets, and I don't know all their sets, so it's kind of a blind experiment that we're going through here, but. I hope you understand the rationale behind both. Again, Clefable, if it's a set that can force progress, be it displacing an item or starting a sweep to force in something like Blissey, even if that means you're just going to switch out of it and go to someone to set up stealth rocks or pressure it, that is completely fine. It is a way of feeling out how the opponent reacts to you and getting an idea of their sets, and information is huge in the early game after all. So yeah. As for the Rise aside, I just think it's Kerem. Nothing else really leads well. You could be Cinderace and just U-turn on a hip out on, but nah. No, I, I'd go Kiram. So let's see here. Gonna be Cinderace for Cedar Mass on the Kiram. All right, I just want to see what the Clefable set is. And it was Wishport after all. Okay, so I think I was pretty right here. I think I hit this one in the head most. So leading Wishport Clef doesn't make a ton of sense. Put yourself in the back foot. Yeah, it's gonna give you momentum on turn two, but it just it risks him leading Cinderace. And honestly, you could switch into Kiram. Well, you can't switch into Kerem too well, and while you could force out Kerem there, you potentially scare it out with the Cinderace and get chip on it, so not all helpers lost. So yeah, that's that. Uh, Ryza did win with the 12 kiss in the end. He got a little lucky there, but you know how it goes. Anyway, uh, we stopped this one to lead, so we'll go ahead and go back to lead here and just pause here now. Yeah, okay. Anyway, third game off, we have a game against Electric Win, another member of Team Germany, this time around against CBU of Team Greece. This goes back to the corner finals, this is on the 23rd of July, but again, same metagame. Hmm. Okay, so here's another example of a hyper-offensive team being used. Electric Win is using a lead extra hyper-offensive team. Now, what's interesting is, some hyper-offenses in the World Cup have actually been using lead choice scarf extra. And because of that, they're trying to pry on like Sidra's trying to use turn to break Sash turn 1. And because of that, Cinderace is not the lead for CBU. Even if it breaks action, you turn out. No, 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 no. There are two possible leads for CBU in my eyes. Both of them predicting he'll lead with Drill. Because Electric Wind is 100% leading Drill. Sash Drill is almost innegotiably led in all the games it's used in pretty much. Unless you're facing something that's multi hit. And you're not going to assume it's a Shifu Water on this team. It's going to be your Shifu Dark. I'm like fairly certain. Compliments card out a lot better, otherwise you have some overlap and more things to check you. But yeah, no, um... Excuse me. So, as for ZBU, I think that the play is easily crawled on, because you can knock it off down to Sash and awkward just break it, or even just awkward it twice, that works too. If you think it might be Choice Scarf, that works. But yeah, otherwise you could lead with your Urshifu. Urshifu's health doesn't matter, as long as it's alive with Sucker Punch, health really is completely inconsequential, so... Right now, I'm leading with, leaning with Urshifu just because Aqua Jet's also really nice here for Vol. So, you don't necessarily want to let the Crowdon take a ton of damage here. You really don't want it in Sucker Punch range for the opposing Cinderace either. So, yeah, I think Urshifu makes the most sense, but Crowdon is fine. And as for Electric Wind, well, you always lead Drill in this game. If you really want to get cheeky and predict them to lead like Mandibuzz or their, uh, one of their Dark types, then you can lead Magirna. He's got like three dark types. Wow, this is like some dark spam here. You can lead Magirna, Knight, and it does well against four potential options here. He's, he's probably never going to lead Cinderace. This is a fair of the Scarf lead and Mungus. So, yeah, um, I'm thinking Urshifu is to play, but I'm thinking Urshifu on Drill is to play, but again, we can see alternatives. Crawdon for CBU, and I guess Magirna for Ewan, but I love that. It's going to be like a passive setup, so they can't win without support. So, yeah, Let's see here. We're going to see Urshifu on Drill. Okay, that's great. Was it Sash Drill? Switched out, so probably not. Hmm. It's a weird. I'm not gonna bother. Okay, let's we'll go back to turn one. But anyway, yeah. So 
I got the leads right here, but at the same time, like, this was, this was one of the more obvious examples. This was a softball fish. Next game, okay, this is a bit more interesting. This is between Twix Street of Team Europe and Luthier of Team US Midwest. Two teams that I support, two friends of mine as well. Twix Street's a really great player in OU, and Luthier has played Little Cup, and now is transitioning to lower tiers, and more importantly, OU. He's doing really well, so definitely big shout out to those guys, and be sure to check out Luthier's channel as well. Uh, my dude, uh, he doesn't have the most subscribers, but he uploads some pretty solid stuff. Yeah, he doesn't upload like every day per se, but I mean, he gets solid content out there. Yeah, he's uploading Grand Slam videos and stuff. And he's just a really solid player. And definitely check him out if you want more like analytical, like tournament game, go, go, going through tournament games. So, yeah, um, all right, yeah, here we go. But anyway, back to his game itself, because I don't want to spend this whole video plugging people. No, this is meant to tell you guys how to lead. For Twix Tree, there's a strategy that I really like, and it's leading with Ditto just to scout the sack. Because look at these teams. This is screaming 150 turn game right off the bat. It's Blissey plus Clef plus Mandibuzz versus Blissey plus Reuniculus plus Mandibuzz. And then there's like Stealth Rocket Powdown, Cox Specs, and other You know, it's a lot. So leading Ditto gives you information turn one. It forces you to know their set. And if they lead with something like Ferrothorn, you can actually trade hazards, potentially get knocked off. And if your Ditto is knocked off, that's actually better in this matchup because then you get 20 free PP each time. And you can switch moves with their Pokemon. It's not like revenge killing is like super important here because you have the Keldeo cover pretty nicely with Pax plus Reuniclus, presum presumably. So, yeah, I think here, if you're Trick Street, you actually lead with Ditto. But if you don't want to lead with Ditto, if you want to like try and get Nox off or status off early on the game, then Pax is a great alternative as well. As for Luthier, God, I don't know. I mean, I think Hippowdon makes some sense, but you actually don't want to be too weak against the Pax. You know, no, nah, not Hippowdon. You don't know, I think it's Clefable or Blissey's lead here. I think I lean Clefable, just because it's able to observe status and it doesn't mind getting knocked off as much as Heavy Duty Boots uh, Blissey is, because Stealth Rock plus Toxic Drill can get rocks up and pressure Mandibuzz, so therefore taking 12.5% each time with your Blissey isn't great. See, so yeah, I think lead Clef makes the most sense right now, but Blissey is a close second, and Hippowdon is probably more distant third. But yeah, Ditto is a cool lead because it can give you their information right off the bat. And in long games, information is the key to figuring out what your win conditions are or what your their win conditions are so you can prevent them from coming to fruition, basically. Anyway, let's see here. It's gonna be a Ditto. All right, on a Blissey. Oh, okay. So it's like the second most likely mod. So it's like one and a half out of two again. All right, I don't want to go too far into this, but yeah. Um, anyway, that's the fourth game. And the final game is a game between Rexus and XM Raptor. From July 22nd, XM Raptor is in Team Latin America, a really strong player and a good friend of mine. Definitely a huge supporter of this guy. He actually has the sample stall team built for sample teams, and he's a really solid and smart player. I love watching this dude. And the other player um, for Team Italy is Rexus, who's also a solid player for them. He previously played tiers like PU a bit more, but he's actually thriving in OU this generation, it seems. So, yeah, good for him. Anyway, as for lead tier, I actually am not really sure about this one. This is a stumper. Now, the obvious things for me would be potentially leading with the Clefable for both sides because it's able to absorb status, it's able to potentially set up rocks for Raptor, can like calm mind up and force specific plays, and overall it's great at like feeling out the opponent because you got to figure out what their set is to counteract like Clef and break through things without status because these are both bulkier teams. Because of that, I think my first instinct is for Raptor to lead Clef. As for Rexus though, I think I'd lead Pex before Clef just because you might have Nox, Skull, Toxic, and be able to force things on all these Pokemon is great. It's toxic, it's really good for Stick Kill Gastrodon. If it's knock off, it's really good to knock off things like Blissey and Clefable. But Pat Clef is also a safe option from him there. Now, in these bulky and bulky games, the key early on is just to feel momentum and get an incremental little piece of progress, be it knocking things off or statusing things, etc. So, again, minor gains without making major risks. And leading off with these bulky, durable Pokemon is great. So, I'm thinking Clefable from XM Raptor with Blissey being the second most likely. And as for Rexus, Clefable is the second most likely, and Toxic is the most likely, so let's see what they lead with here. We're going to see a Clefable from Raptor on a Clefable from Rexus. Okay. So, Clef on Clef action there. So, again, like one and a half out of two. On the game overall, I was pretty accurate. I at least got, like, it was every single lead of these t five games. All ten leads were in my, like, wheelhouse, but my primary idea was right in, like, seven of them, I think, and I got, like, the secondary idea was right in, like, three or four of them, whatever it was, so... 
that's all right, but I'm not really here to boast about my accuracy, but it's more just explaining the trend, leading a bit more conservatively perhaps, and then finding yourself into more risky positions later on that you can leverage the position. You can justify the risk you're taking instead of risking it all in turn one, leading un into very unfavorable matchups in the early game. You don't want to put yourself behind early on. You want to try and maximize that position. So be very thoughtful about what you lead with and use this as another piece of team preview information that you go over in important matches for sure. I hope this information helped you guys. And if there are any other pieces of gameplay that I'm going to go over via video, then let me know in the comments below. And if it gets enough support and if enough people voice their opinion on it, then I would most definitely consider that for sure. Uh, again, if you guys are enjoying this channel and the content I put out, if you guys could like, comment, subscribe, that would mean the world to me. Being close to 5,000 subscribers and a like and comment always would make my day. So yeah, that'd be great. And speaking of days, guys, have a great day. This is Finch signing out for now. Peace out, guys. Bye.